players where you have to carry your own gear. As a drummer, it's it's really intense. Yeah. And I, I there there are service elevators that we've had to use that I've had to use for gigs in the city, and the elevators are big enough for barely two people standing up and you've got to put your gear in there and get in and get out. It's really an intense exercise to You have to be committed. Like if you're going to be an instrumentalist professionally in New York City, it's hard. Yeah, you like you can't just do it it's for hard. fun, you know? You're like, "Oh, I'm just going to do this one week." No. no. Not the wrong that, place. No, it's 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 an intense it's an intense experience. So in any case, that's not good for your health, Dave. What are you smoking there? Cannabis. Cannabis. Okay. <laughs> not cigarettes. <laughs> no. You, you, you get you're getting ready for our interview. Oh, listen, please. You know it, it's so great. It's interesting because when you because I've had an opportunity of interest like interviewing different types of people. When you interview artists, it's a whole different experience. I feel because you're going to teach me things in this interview that I probably never knew of before, you know, and touch on things that you don't always think about. You don't always like wonder to yourself, hmm, that did happen to me. Why did that happen to me? What did I learn from that? You know, like you have a career that spans many, many decades and there's so much to learn. There's so many fuck ups, right, that happens along the road. But it's where we are now, I feel like, is the most important, like with everything that we have from the past. Okay, I'll try to share some wisdom with you. <sighs> Let's make it interesting. I'm curious because, you know, the industry has changed so much in like past 10 years, 20 years. What was it like when you were starting up? Well, I grew up in New York City. And I had an opportunity as a kid to check out some of the greatest jazz musicians alive at the time, from Count Basie and his big band, to Elvin Jones, to Philly Joe Jones, to Buddy Rich, to... Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, and on and on and on. And the opportunity to see that level of talent, that level of musical genius on a regular basis established a certain baseline of what performance looked like at the highest level. And that established a certain threshold in terms of skill, musicianship, technique, professionalism. You had a chance to see the greatest of the great right in front of you, and they were constantly on display. You could get close to the energy of the performer. You could watch the way they managed uh, a show, the way they worked a room, the way they managed a band. Everybody learned and from each so, other. Th there it was. I mean, there, there was your laboratory. And so w when you had a chance to see these types of musical geniuses up front consistently, regularly, you knew what the industry was about. You knew what it took to succeed or not succeed as a professional jazz musician in New York City. It helped you understand what the game was. Like a real playing, you know, ball playing perspective where you can see clearly what steps you would need to take. Right? Am, am I coming off the right place? Yeah. Absolutely. As opposed to what I see all too often uh, today, and that is uh, a level of fantasy, a level of uh, self delusion in in some in some regard. That 
Yeah. It is it is a completely unreal perspective that many younger musicians and I would go even outside of just the the musical field, I would just say in life in general. The people, for example, if you looked at somebody like a, a, a Buddy Rich or you are a Count Basie or a, or an Art Blakey or an Elvin Jones, these musicians poured their being into the passion of their music, their performance, the the level of their performance, and it established a certain benchmark that was incredibly high, incredibly intense, and it was incredibly consistent. There was, yeah. there really, there were no bad nights, you know, there was, there was brilliant and there was near brilliant, but there was never anything else. And when you saw that as a musician, you realized that that was what the, the jazz industry, that's what these performers stood for. And if you were going to play this music, that's what you had to shoot for also. It, and that, it's, that, that, that comparator, yeah. I think, is not quite clear to younger people, younger musicians today. No, and it, you, you bring up a really excellent point because I remember when I was living in California, I was working for my brother's company. He had one of his, co- his workers. He was a technician, brilliant man, and he loved jazz. And I just loved the way he spoke about jazz. And he was maybe five, six years older than me. I'm 24. He was probably about 27, 28. And it's something you have to get into physically. Isn't that the whole beauty about instrumental art? You know, seeing instruments being played, hearing them, how they sound, what you can do with them. It doesn't happen on a TikTok video for one minute. It happens in real life when those moments happen, right? And I'll tell you that as a as a as a drummer, you have to also keep yourself in a good enough physical condition that you've got the strength and the stamina and the practice and the dexterity to be able to manage playing the instrument. Um, and as a band leader, not only do you have to perform, but you have to speak to the audience. You have to communicate about the history of the music. You have to interface with the audience. There's promotion involved. Uh, the, we had did a recent show for uh, the uh, NPR affiliate WYCN in, uh, in Worcester, outside of Boston. Nice. And we had uh, radio promotion and I did podcasts and I was on radio shows and, and on and on and on. And this is also part of the uh, commitment that the musician makes so that there's got to be education, there's got to be promotion, there's marketing, there's, of course, the music component, which has to do with putting together charts and putting together tune lists and then coordinating with your bandmates. And sometimes there are rehearsals, but often there are no rehearsals. You just show up and you have a sound check and you play. You have to deal with the environment. You have to deal with uh, the equipment. Uh, it, it goes on and on and on. So these are all of the components and many others. And that has nothing to do with practicing your, your instrument and keeping right. your chops up and being able to uh, be prepared. Uh, I have a, a, a comment in my head, Dave, that my uh, instructor taught me years ago, John Riley, the great John Riley. And he said to me, Josh, he said, when you're playing, when you're performing, he said, think about what you have to think about to be ready when you get to a point in the song to do what you have to do. Think about what you have to think about to be ready when you get there. So when you yeah. are when you are performing and there are things happening in a song and there's happening uh, within a set of music, even while you're performing and you are in that moment of improvisation, you've got to be thinking about what you have to think about 
to be ready for the next thing because it happens very fast. It's constantly moving. And so the, the number of layers or levels that the musician needs to be operating on concurrently, it's complex stuff. Yeah, it is. And it's so strange because when you're, when you listen to a song, you know, when you hear a, a jazz progression and you hear the, um, you hear the horns blare, it's wild. The feelings and the emotions that you get when you're playing that instrument, like just being in that environment with your buddies, you know, your friends, and you're just creating something that is special. I, I can totally see that. You, you, you have to like think clearly and vividly of what you're doing to, to not only grasp, but to be a part of that, you know? Well, if I can expand on that a little bit, I, I don't know how many of your listeners are musicians or jazz musicians or like jazz. All kinds of or, people. Okay. This is, this is, so we're going to talk a little bit musically at this point. Oh, yeah. But, at, but as a, a musician, there's a number of things going through the musician's consciousness during uh, a, a performance. Number one, you have to know as a jazz musician, you have to have some sense of the form of the song. Every song has a form and you have to, it's the roadmap. You have to know what, obviously what the melody is, but you also have to know the right. form. Mm -hmm. Number two, you're listening to your bandmates and there's certain ebb and flow of energy that has to do with solo and sections of the song and so forth. And so as a drummer, you're working on building uh, and or reducing the intensity of the song based upon what's going on right. with your musical colleagues right around you. Then there are decisions that you may have in your mind about what you intend to try to do during the song. So for example, there are certain, as a drummer, uh, grooves, or there may be certain musical motifs or certain solo ideas that you are going to go for if you feel it in the song. And so these are things that you may have premeditated in your mind, and you may or may not go for them based upon how you feel and the whole vibe of the improvisation. And then the next piece is just improvisation itself, which is whatever just comes out based upon your years of training and musicianship, and it either shows up or it doesn't show up, and you go with it. And uh, that part of the journey is is sort of un, unexpected. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes it doesn't work, uh, and you keep going. Uh, you never but sometimes know, though. it's unbelievable. Yeah. But when you're in it, you don't know where it's going, though. Right? That is the that is the truth. But once you, you finally... I feel that way so many times with music. It's where you, you open up the first door in the hallway, you walk down the hallway, and you open up the last door. You don't know what's going on on either side until you reach that end. That is... A, a good, I think a good analogy. Um, but I would say that as you gain more and more experience with a group of musicians you play with regularly, everybody gets to know the strengths and the weaknesses of the other musicians. And you tend to play in a way that enhances everybody's talents. And you know what they are, and everybody sort of works together. That's what makes a band a band. Yeah. It's like the ultimate collaboration. The people. You can play with musicians, but if you don't know the, the assets of the other musicians... We're all about the artist. That is the whole purpose of this podcast, period. And you have a really valuable tool. You can share this with artists people that are creative, someone that can uh, enjoy this podcast and really enjoy the experience of Lost in the Groove. So, 
With that, let's jump back to today's episode, shall we? Uh, it doesn't necessarily work very, very well. But if the musicians know each other and they've played together and they're all really talented people, good things really happen. It's interesting, though, because there's a flip side to it. You know, take characters such as Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison was a horrible person to work with in regards to his bandmates. I'm not making this up. They were interviewed and they said it themselves. So, but strangely enough, they made really good music. It's kind of odd. You know, you think well, to yourself, don't you need everybody to work together to make great music? But Well, I'll, I'll tell you my perspective is okay. maybe a little bit different than that to each his own. But I would rather play with a very good musician not an amazing musician okay. who's a terrific person as opposed to an amazing musician who's an asshole. <laughs> so I, I, would, I would rather play with a very good musician who's a terrific person where we have a great relationship any day of the week over somebody who's like out of, just off, off the Richter scale with talent, but a real schmuck. I'm not interested in that. <laughs> You stay away from certain kinds. Because For good it's reason. not fun. It's just not yeah. as much fun. I don't I don't want listen, here's the thing. I don't want the stress. I don't want the aggravation. I would rather have a good time and I'm I want the, the experience of, of making uh whether it's going to be a performance uh, successful or recording successful, I want these experiences to be really enjoyable. And what makes them enjoyable is working with terrific people. And if the person's a you know a talented musician, it's all good. Uh, if, if a person is an extremely difficult personality but a great uh, musician, it's just not as a rewarding. It's not a rewarding experience for me personally. That's just not my scene. Yeah, it's just weird when you. <clears throat> I mean, for yourself, when you're living in New York, you get to bump into a lots of kinds of people, all sorts of kind of people, and. I mean, I, I, I haven't met that many artists in my life comparatively. And it's weird when you, I feel when you meet a certain amount and you, you see how people are, you know, like you mentioned, where there are people that are super talented, but then there's also like they're super shitty and they're just a horrible human being. But then you can get someone that's a good person. They're pretty good in real life too. Like you get that equal balance. You know that because you've met people, you've interacted with so many people, you've seen how they performed and how they are as individuals when the lights go down. Correct. And so as a band leader, especially, you want to work with people that you can really hang with and that you right. respect and you can have a good relationship with. That's that's important. You know, I've I've had experiences working with musicians that haven't been pleasant, and you know I I don't go back to those relationships. Do you feel a lot of times where I'm I'm always curious about this, like the negative vibes where people can get very aggressive and angry, sometimes be addicted to certain things as an artist. I think it's like due to pressure or life. I feel like there's a lot of factors that go into it, but. There's something that know. causes that. I I don't, you know, think it would be appropriate to generalize, but I can say that typically, you know, people who are musicians are very sensitive people. And with a high degree of sensitivity come uh, sometimes uh, certain uh, emotional challenges. Right. And you know, some people deal with those uh, sensitivities and those emotional challenges uh, better. Some don't. And uh, that, I think, is part of the uh, experience of working with the musical uh, uh, personality. Uh, it's, it's less common uh, to find uh, uh, people who are artists who are also not only, you know, uh, uh, left brain and right brain oriented people. That's not that common. It, it, it occurs, but it's not that common. Yeah. I don't know. It's just that 
there's a lot of things that that goes into being an artist. You know, it, it's not just about being playing an instrument. It's also being sometimes the the odd person out of the group. A lot of the times people gravitate towards playing drums, playing bass, because they don't necessarily fit in. They fit in elsewhere. That's their you know, niche. That's their groove. You know, people who are musicians or artists on any level, uh, and you could take any art, dance, uh, media, music, uh, any form of music, people who have an artistic uh, orientation, Dave, are people that perceive the the world and have a relationship to their feelings and their inner experience uh, from a perspective that's a little bit different than uh, people who don't artistically view the world. And they feel the need to express the uh, perceptions that they have, the feelings that they have, it's important to them, uh, and, and and what you get uh, varies obviously from artist to artist, but the the artistic individual has a, a point of view, uh, whether it's emotional or um, perceptual, that's a little bit different. Typically, it's it's interesting. It's it it's sort of like a a, a new a new point. Uh, uh, from which to look at and examine things, which makes people say, huh, that's cool. That's interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that. I wouldn't have felt that. Right. And uh, they want to share that. And hopefully people gravitate to it, sometimes just a few, sometimes many. But that's that's the artistic personality uh, to some degree, I think. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting to look at it, to look at it from that approach, you know, because, I mean, when you, <clears throat> sorry, when you spend the time learning an instrument, you know, spending your time um, figuring out the different chords, the different progressions, and the, the different things that you can do. And, you know, like we've mentioned on top of the fact that, you know, being a part of a band, collaborating and learning across from other, other, other kinds of people. But that takes effort. That takes something to put in, you know, and... It starts somewhere. Well, as a as a uh, musician, as a jazz musician, I, I had the uh, point of of starting listening to Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich and Joe Morello and and um, Blakey and 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 Philly Joe and Joe Jones and it just goes on and on and on. And so I had a chance to listen to the aspects of their playing that inspired me as a kid. And what I thought sounded great, I'd try to copy. I try to understand how do they play that? How do they do that? What technique is required to be able to do the things they do? And inevitably, if the music inspires you as a musician and these musicians inspire you in terms of what they can do, then the question is, what do you have to practice? What do you have to be able to do to emulate or copy what they do? And inevitably, you, you come to the conclusion that there's miles of distance between where you are and what these, what these musicians were able to uh, accomplish. And so now if you're serious about it, you find teachers and you ask them, how do you get from here to there? And they give you the techniques and then you have to practice them over and over and over again and you're committed to trying slowly to get better and you try to enhance your understanding the and same thing over come, and over and over yeah. and over and again and then you discover what you can't do and then there's the next thing i'll give you an example so about um it must have been about 10 years ago i there were a series of uh solos that I was listening to by the great Joe Morello, who played uh, with Dave Brubeck, and and Joe Morello was the drummer who recorded the famous Take Five, uh, and Take Five is maybe the most famous jazz uh, recording ever. 
And I listened to a series of of, uh, of solos and fills and so forth that that Morello uh, had played on a couple of recordings. And I and I went to my uh, instructor and I and I said, John, let's break this down. And we transcribed the solos and we broke down <clears throat> a number of the techniques into uh, bite sized kind of essential pieces. And I started practicing it. And then, Dave, what I discovered is that I didn't have the technique necessary to be able to play the solo motifs that Morello was playing. So I had to take two steps backwards, even from just the transcript, to be able to start work on my chops, to be able to do the things that Morello did at a tempo of 250 beats per minute, I had to practice it at 100 beats per minute, and I had to practice it for a year or two years before I even began to get more and more dexterity. And over the course of three or four or five years, I started get, getting closer and closer in terms of my technique and my understanding to be able to actually begin to try to do what I heard five years ago in some of Morello's solos. How's that? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, one, one thing that comes to mind is, um, I always give this, the Beatles. You know, most people remember, like, the Beatles started off, their music was, eh, okay, it was fun. But then something happened. They went to Hamburg, Germany. What did they do in Hamburg, Germany? They spent eight hours practicing, just doing music, eight hours every single day. And that sounds preposterous, like eight hours every single day. Your finger must be killing, you know, your, your fingernails must be cut off and bleeding everywhere. But that's what they did. And you could see that in their music. You could see all of the work that goes into the music. So... It's incredible when you hear this this melodic piece and it's just so beautiful. And then when you actually break it down, you realize, whoa, this person had a certain technique or move or position that they reached that point because they practiced and they spent the time and yada, yada, whatever the reason is to get there. So there's like another level deeper in this already melodic crazy snazzy piece that you have in front of you it's like is there more well you know what you're describing is i think embodied in a in a, a little uh, anecdote about the great john coltrane the tenor saxophonist the jazz tenor saxophonist and coltrane was in a recording session and uh, I mean, there was there was nobody that could play like Coltrane. And he was in the middle of a, a recording session, Dave. And in between takes, he would take his tenor saxophone, go into the bathroom and practice. I bathroom. want you to think about what I want you to think about what I'm telling you, that on a recording session, in between takes, Coltrane would go to the bathroom and practice before the next take. Think about that. Happy place? It's a level of intensity in terms of what he needed to to do to get yeah. what he felt in his heart and in his mind out through that instrument. That's how hard he worked. Yeah, it... it it's like a it's like a deeper level in a way of like me, almost meditation where I this reminds me I do not remember his name but there was an audio engineer or producer uh sometime in the 70s uh he owned a record label he had this thing where whenever he had music that was approached to him he had a crappy radio that was specifically put into his car he specifically asked for a cheap crappy radio and he would put the you know the a track or whatever into the into the to the piece and he would listen to it and if it sounded good in that system then it was okay to print like 
the, and it same example like you have this man that's doing a, a recording session like I'm going to start recording. I'm just going to do my practice in there. There's a reason why. And then when you you know the reason why, you said are asking yourself your questions. What are the benefits would you gain from being in that situation, doing doing it that way, trying it a different way? Well, I think we're talking about people that have uh, a love and a commitment to uh, their art form that makes them geniuses. This is why they're as good as they are. It's not just uh, magic that they, they get this good. They work their ass off and they never stop. Yeah, That's the point. That's the point. And that's, to get back to one of your earlier questions, that's really the key, in my opinion, to becoming a good musician, an excellent professional musician, is you have to have a commitment uh, to practice and evolve your your technique and your ability uh peter erskine the great drummer and and uh, educator uh talks about how your first obligation as a musician is to listen to music all the time for the rest of your life if you're a musician you have to always be listening to music always that is your job as a musician and whether i'm preparing for a show or i'm preparing for a recording uh project uh i am always listening to music i don't necessarily uh actively take everything i'm listening to apart but when i hear things that inspire me or that i think sound good or that i think are pretty or that I think are uh, uh, ideas that I could do something with, I, I think, oh, that's cool. That's cool. And I'm always listening for something that's new, different, innovative, something that answers a question, something that enhances my own technique, something that helps me gain further insight. I'm always listening, even if it's not super active. I'm always listening. Yeah. It's something that we kind of forget. You know, it's where, let's be real, having an open conversation is not a legit thing these days. You know, the, the second you start opening up your mouth, ah, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, I don't agree with that opinion. So what? Who cares? You know, if you put that type of mentality, can you imagine if you had that type of mentality on music? Well, people <laughs> have that mentality about music all the time. <laughs> Not in my circles. Okay. I mean, seriously. Yeah. No, I, I, I hate that. I, that's, that's, uh, well, I, you know, look, when I was a kid, I was very, very close-minded to many, many different forms of music outside of jazz. I, I liked, I was a snob. I liked jazz, and that's kind of what I like to listen to. And I didn't like. I didn't like you mentioned the Beatles. I didn't care for the Beatles, and I didn't like the Jackson Five or Michael Jackson stuff. Or I mean, I, I wasn't into it. I have to say. And as I got older, I realized that I had a closed mind, and that these musicians were amazing, and the music was amazing, and there was so much to learn. And you know, I, I mean, I, I will never tell you that Ringo Starr's uh, solos were, you know. They stopped the show. They didn't. But I loved the grooves and I loved the music and I it listened is a reason, and I learned. It is a reason why I don't own any Ringo's on vinyl. But I do own jo George Harrison. I do like – George Harrison, I will I will have to say, had a really great solo career. And what I loved the most was ha over his span until unfortunately he passed away, um, his learning of different instruments – and adding those to his different albums. So one thing you'll see in his career is like each album, you'll hear a different sound, something new, something interesting. And you're like, oh, and what George did was he spent his time learning about it, learning about the environment and what to add. And that is that is something that I can learn from an artist, you know, and, and take with me and 
maybe inspire me to do something with it. It's like we leave breadcrumbs for one another, whether we, we think about it or not. You know? Same thing with music. There, is, there, there really isn't a musician you can point to that you can't learn something from at this level. I mean, I, I heard an interview recently with, with Ringo, and uh, he, he said, and as I said, you know, as a jazz drummer, I look at his chops, I look at his, his technique, and I think, you know, okay, fine. But I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, be wowed by by Ringo's soloing his technique, but his grooves and and his musicality are are, are fabulous. And he says something uh, in this interview, and he says, "I always had to be ready at the drum kit because I never knew when we were going to start, and I never knew when we, I had to be." on it immediately from the first note. And I was very impressed because he was always ready to immediately back up the band. And there was a very important lesson in that statement. And I learned a very important insight from Ringo with that one comment. So my point is that everybody, everybody at that level has something to teach. Everybody has something to teach. You know, it's really important that you bring this up because George um, said this. Ringo was known like he was always on time, but there was once that he wasn't on time. He left in the middle of a meeting. And George said that when he left from the meeting, he knew the band was over. And it's, it's funny. You have to ask yourself, like, Ringo was a drummer. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't like the main of the four. But he was the person that brought the band together. There's always that one person that brings everybody together. You always have that main person. It's not because like you're forcing everyone together. You know, you know what everybody needs in a way, and everybody knows how to feed off of one and one of one another because of it. You're kind of like a composer, you know. Well, I I, I don't know whether the drummer is the composer most of I'm the time. I'm just giving that as an example in, in the case of the Beatles, but yeah. But I would say this, that, that the, the drummer is foundational to any song and the groove that the drummer lays down defines the genre of the song. If a, if a, if a drummer lays down a rock groove, it's a rock song. If it's a, a funk groove, it's a funk song. Uh, the drummer can't lay down a funk groove and turn it into a jazz tune or play a jazz tune and have it be a rock song. doesn't work that way. So whatever groove the drummer lays down, that defines the genre of the song, period, period. Yeah. So the drummer has a, a, a very, very critical role to play. But uh, again, when you um, have Even an in jazz. Drums are really important in jazz, right? Like it's when you get those deeper notes, those higher um, spikes in the song. Well, for, for sure. But I, I would say that that's true, you know, in, in many, many forms of music. Right. Not, not just not just jazz. No, not just jazz, but that's just like one thing that just came to mind. Yeah. But what I would say is that the, the role of the drummer is critical in terms of coalescing the sound of a band, clearly. So the, the, the point I guess we wanted to make here is that there is so much to learn with an open mind with regard to uh, any great musician in any of the uh, genres of music. And a jazz drummer can learn from a rock drummer, and a rock drummer can learn from a funk drummer, and on and on and on. If the musicianship is at a high level, everybody can learn from everybody. And, and yeah. that, that, I think, is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, you know, I wanted to lead off on this with you, you, made, you, know, you made your own business. You took something from your career and built something from it. Do you want to walk me through exactly what you did? And, you know, we, yeah. 
I'm not sure I am clear on your question, Dave. Can you can you zero the, in on me? The Verve. Yes. The question is, how did I start the band? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've told this story many times, but in essence, I heard some really terrific young uh, musicians uh, back in the Danbury, Connecticut area. Hey, it's Dave, and I quickly just wanted to jump in and say, if you've been enjoying the podcast and enjoying this episode, if you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, that'll be so greatly appreciated. Because here's the thing. Someone might read that review and make the choice if they want to listen to the podcast. You get to help grow this podcast with us. How fucking cool is that? Let's jump back to today's episode. In 2006, uh, that I thought really were terrific jazz players. And, and I was a, a, a jazz musician uh, from uh, the time I was a kid in New York. And I had played with bands and I uh, did a whole bunch of uh, uh, stuff uh, as a, uh, a sideman and participating in uh, traveling big band and on and on. But I never had my own group and I, I had no interest in it particularly. But I heard John Blank, who was uh, uh, a, a young tenor saxophonist from uh, West Con in uh, Connecticut, performing in Danbury with uh, Chris DeAngelis, uh, a bassist, and, and uh, some other players. And I thought he was terrific. And I introduced myself to John and I said, hey, man, I love, I love your, your, uh, your saxophone playing and I, I really think you're a terrific jazz player. Would you like to get together and play some, uh, some music? And uh, he said, yeah, why not? Sure. You know, if you'll book, if you'll book it, I'll, I'll, I'll show up. And so I did. And to make a long story short, we started performing at country clubs and restaurants and we started a, a following in the uh, Connecticut uh, uh, area and it became substantial. And uh, we performed in large groups, consistently came out to hear our music. And this went on for years. We eventually recorded our first CD uh, in 2012. Uh, it went to number five on the national charts. Uh, I was completely shocked. <laughs> and I said to the, uh, to the radio promoter, uh, Neil Sapper, who was handling our music out of California, I thanked him for this amazing experience. And uh, he said, what do you mean? I said, what do I mean? We recorded our, our CD. We had this amazing experience. I'm done. I'm going back to, you know, performing. And, and he said, you can't do that, man. He said, you just, you just have a number, a number five uh, a <laughs> CD on the charts. You can't just disappear. You, you need to do another recording. I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. So I said, all right, all right, one more. So we recorded another album and we released it a year later and it also went top 10. And that's when I realized, I said, well, maybe there's something here. Maybe we really do have a following. And that was the beginning of the band uh, sort of migrating from a performing group more to a record a recording group. And um, that was the beginning of a, of a run of about uh, five, five top 10 albums, including a number one album in 2018, Connect the Dots. And uh, the Verve Jazz Ensemble started to develop a national and international following. And uh, here we are, you know, 10 years later into our recording career and uh, almost 20 years into the beginning of the band. And uh, we have a, a big following nationally, internationally, and we've recorded and released eight albums. And, uh, you oh. know, there it is. But it was, it was not by design. It was not by design, Dave. It was not by design. It all sort of I happened. Mean, by, you, by said, you said you were you going to do one and you were done. You know, you were going to move on and, and finish. Was it? I mean, what has it turned into now for you? I mean, a lot of things have changed, especially when you started your career as a, um, as a jazz musician to getting a, a part of this and to where you are now. I mean, how has it been for you? Like, especially like in the past few years. Well, first of all, I love the music. I do this purely because of my love of the art form. Uh, you know, we don't do this to make money, obviously. 
there is not much money to be made in in jazz. And if you can run a band that can pay its bills and record an album every year or so, or uh, uh, have the band booked and and perform on a, a even a semi regular basis, that's pretty good. Because you've only got about two percent of the listening audience in the United States that listens to this art form, jazz. It's not a very popular uh, musical form anymore. It used to be, but it isn't anymore in the United States. It's far more popular in many countries around the world, uh, certain countries in Europe, Japan, and, and so forth. Yes, yes. But in, in uh, the United States, many people will say, oh, I love jazz, but they don't really follow jazz. They don't really know the art form that well. Uh, they'll listen to it. It's 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 interesting. It's intriguing, but they don't really know the players. They don't know the history. So you know we don't have uh, a strong component, a large component of the of the listening audience in, in America uh, that's focused on jazz anymore. So our job here at the VJE is to try to bring the palette of jazz to as many listeners as we can. And as I say all the time, Dave. Uh, our listeners are a, a broad array of uh, those who are new to jazz and don't know anything about jazz, but are interested in listening because it sounds cool and they like it and they want to learn more, to people who have been listening to it for 50 years and think it's the greatest music in the world. And so we try to appeal to, to both ends of the spectrum, which is not necessarily an easy thing to do, but that's the kind of the the uh, uh, objective that uh, as the band leader uh, at the VJE, Verb Jazz Ensemble, that's what we try to do, is make jazz accessible to a very wide uh, listening audience from novice jazz listeners to experienced uh, and uh, find something exciting for, for both ends of the spectrum to get out of the music. I feel that, first of all, I think it's really beautiful and I think it's a really great way of just showing the history. There's so many genres, but there are so few genres that have such deep roots, especially in American culture. I mean, think of the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, 60s. Just the jazz scene looked like I'm not a novice or, you know, I listen to jazz. I don't know all the names of different people, but um, when you can you can interact and hear different tastes like people that are now right that they're interested in funk and they want to do funk jazz you know or somebody is more interested in more of a pop you know pop jazz or more hazy you know more mellow jazz these are different things that people can try out you know people yes. can see and interact with and I like jazz. I mean, it's sad that it's only 2%. You know, you wish that, like, more people would be into it, but. It is what it is, man. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of reasons that only 2% of the listening audience listen to this music today. That's a whole other conversation. How did yeah. we get here? But if you go back to the 1930s I'll, I'll pick up on some of your comments you know the pick up on the the big band era uh and you follow the era of the the, the early big band era to the uh period of the big bands during world war ii and then to the bebop era and then to uh cool jazz hard bop west coast uh latin Afro-Cuban, more electronic uh, jazz. You get into the stuff like Weather Report, Brecker Brothers in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, you move into the 80s and, and so forth. Every uh, decade, every uh, generation of music evolved a sound and they took the art form in a different direction. So you're interested in jazz. Who are some of the people that you like to listen to? How did you discover jazz initially? What were some of your influences as a jazz listener? It's hard to say, like, some things that I... I don't have any specific people that I like to listen to. I have a, cer 
I have a certain playlist, and this comes from how I used to listen to jazz. I listen to a lot of like New Orleans 1930s jazz, um, 40s. That's primarily what I'm into. Um, if I listen to vocal, it's going to be Ella Fitzgerald or Billie Holiday is one example. Um, the way that I fell into jazz was when I was a kid, we used to go to the library. People don't do this anymore. Surprise. But one of the librarians there was very into jazz. And I remember I was looking at a bunch of DVDs and CDs and stuff that they had laying around. And I started playing around and listening to this stuff when I was a kid. And whenever I have the opportunity to see like a jazz performance, whenever I'm out, or something. I just like sit there. It the reason is because a lot of the times when you don't physically see it, you don't realize that there's four or five instruments and they're like facing a corner. And then the you have the clarinet blows and you see the drums, you know, changing its beat and then you see the bass player changing to a different instrument. It, you're kind of watching everything move in motion all at once. But yeah, I I should get more into jazz. I really want to, but. Well, it's nice that you are interested in Ella Fitzgerald as an example. And if you if you just take Ella's career. Oh, uh, ooh, you know, she's powerful got, voice. Just uh, she's un, unbelievable. <sighs> she was, you know, the the, the voice described as the voice of God. And Whoa. if you li- if you listen to all of the different organizations, musical organizations that Ella performed with, Dave, if you just follow her career from Chick Webb back in the 1930s all the way through uh, her career, you you will touch almost every component of every major jazz performer for. I don't know what 50 60 years. So if you just if you just examine Ella Fitzgerald's career and you listen to to all of the bands and all the different musical styles that she played with over the course of her career, it would open you up to a hundred or more of the greatest jazz musicians of all time. Just that one exercise would change your entire perspective yeah. to jazz. It and like I was saying earlier, there was something about that period in New Orleans when it came to jazz. You could hear it. I mean, thankfully, there are recordings and so many of them. It was a different time. It was like as if this is all they had to live for. That's it. It's all they're doing. They're doing jazz 24 hours, seven days a week, 365, you know, like. That's it. That's all they have. It's life crazy. Was, life, life was different, dude. They didn't have video games. There was there was there was no Snapchat. You know, you couldn't you couldn't get lost on YouTube. It, no, it, it was a different world, man. I mean, how did did that ever inspire you? You know, did you ever like what what's your um, experience and like feelings towards that type of jazz? I was not motivated by uh, second line and uh, new orleans stuff particularly it never really it never really uh as a kid and as a really? younger uh musician it did not really um impact me i listen to second line uh now and i am uh really uh, amazed at the the groove and i think it's very very hip stuff but when I was younger, it was over my head. I, I just I just didn't dig it. You can't dig everything, man. Everybody, you just can't dig everything. It's I too know, much. Too I much. know. And the, you know, you bring up such a great point. There are so many great eras of jazz. It's like, be honest. Where do you start? Where do you where do, like? If you if anybody asks, like, where do you start your jazz journey? There's so many places to begin. Well, the answer to that question is you begin where you are the most interested. So when I was a kid, I listened to uh, big bands and I 
really enjoyed listening to the big bands. I found the music to be uh, exciting. Uh, I could understand the components of the band. I played in the junior high school and high school bands. So I had a, a context to understand the structure, sax section, horn section, rhythm section, uh, the way the songs were constructed. All of that made sense to me. And uh, I, I, I got a lot out of it. Then I started learning the the specific performance aptitudes of some of the greats, greatest pianists, greatest drummers, greatest horn players. And then I would spend time learning other great pianists and alto sax and tenor sax and trumpet and, and trombone and drums and bassists. And, you know, it, 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 you just start mining different ore of, of, of the, of the musical landscape. And, you know, you, you, over the course of years or decades, you, you, you start to put the pieces together. So it doesn't matter where you start. It just matters that you start at a place that you enjoy. And if you like, for example, weather report and you, or you like funk and you want to listen to uh, you know, uh, I, I mentioned before, you know, the Brecker brothers is a, as a place to start, uh, or, you know, you like Ella Fitzgerald and you want to go back and listen to what she did and recorded the jazz, um, uh, uh, um, in the, in all the performances that she did at jazz at, um, was it, uh, yeah, Paul, the, was, Phil, Phil, the Philharmonic, I forgot the J, J, she, she performed at the Apollo though, many times. Uh, and it, uh, I can't tell you, you know, what her. I think so. What, I think tons, I mean, tons. Well, she she recorded back in the day with with Chick Webb back in the you know the early to mid nineteen thirties. But yeah. my my point is that she recorded a ton in the nineteen fifties with uh, J A T P, whatever that the acronym stands for. I'm 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 spazzing on that right now. But my point is that it doesn't matter where you start. Start somewhere. And go from there. I think this is one of the biggest advantages that we have now is the the amazing fact that because of the internet, we have so many ways of listening to all of this music than ever before. I mean, the options before the internet were very limited. You know, the ways that you'd be able to find all these interesting artists was you go to a music store and you ask the music dude. You know, the guy with dreads that was behind the cash register. But with the work that you're doing, and, and that is that is a perspective to keep in mind. How do you be able to give an opportunity to let everybody hear, just have everything in front of them, choose, figure out what you like? You know, like you said, you don't need to start somewhere you need to begin. You got to find what you like and go from there. Yeah. Don't, don't overly complicate it. It is jazz at the Philharmonic. J-A-T-P is, is the acronym. And Ella Fitzgerald performed for many years with the, the jazz at the Philharmonic uh, program. And just check out her music just with, with the J-A-T-P uh, artists. <clears throat> it doesn't matter, uh, Dave, where you start. Uh, it, you, you, you start based upon what you like to listen to. And you go from there. Uh, if you find, as an example, that you like vocalists, then listen to other vocalists. If you like small combos, listen to other trios. If you like big bands, then listen to other big bands. If you like trumpet trumpet players, go listen to tr other trumpet players. Right. Some you will like, some you won't. And then the ones you like, who did they play with? What were their recordings? Listen to some of those records. What other musicians did you hear from that era? And so forth. That's the way the whole thing opens up. That is the way Pandora's box gets popped open in jazz. Wow. You all right, man? I, I hope you're okay. I'm not no, trying I'm to good. too it's, much information it's, it's, you know, No, it's a, it's a lot to process. It, you know, like, <laughs> like I said at the beginning of this, there's a lot of things oh. that you learn as you do this. You know, one of the things is when you, you talk to people and you have an hour-long conversation and you really break things up and you you go to different places and 
you not only learn something, but you, you learn to have a different approach to it. You're like, okay, doesn't need to be that difficult. You know, it, it could be more of an easier state of mind, you know? It doesn't have to be left or right. Dude, this is supposed to be fun. This yeah. is not supposed – you don't have to have a, a, a master's degree to listen to jazz. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that jazz is too freaking complicated and they turn off. And my message is – no, 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 no. Jazz is not intended to give you brain damage. You're supposed to listen to the music because you dig it, you enjoy it, and then if you find something you like, explore other components of it, whether it's vocalists or instrumentalists or eras or group sizes or whatever that are in the neighborhood and explore. You have to have a curiosity to expand your horizon a little bit at a time. Take little steps, but don't turn this into walking into a liquor store with 72,000 different kinds of red wine. You don't get there overnight. My God. Yeah, and you know, you're right. It's You can overcomplicate other genres too. You can overcomplicate rock. You can overcomplicate heavy metal. You know, you can overcomplicate house. I don't know if you could do that. Sorry. <laughs> but, I don't know, but... But the idea here is my, my job, my job as a jazz musician is to try to make jazz easy. That's my job. I got to try to make jazz easy. If I make ju jazz hard, I failed because jazz should be fun. It should be uh, something that is uh, inspiring. Uh, it should be a form of music that whether you're cleaning your garage, listening to jazz or you're you're hanging out with your friends and it's in the background or you're sitting down to listen because it's really great music and you want to really focus on it there's lots of different approaches to to the music and there's, however you approach it what for yeah. whatever purpose you might have don't make it too difficult please they, they, i don't want to i i want to make it clear this music is not supposed to give you brain damage no, and it's something I wanted to point out, uh, which I wanted to say earlier is, <clears throat> especially <clears throat> for for some people, when, you know, when you're smoking cannabis or people that do edibles, cannabis has a very interesting way when it comes to jazz, and I've noticed this. Like, it's, in many ways, it's a great way to relax, especially when you're having a session. It's a great stress reliever, and... It, just in general, with different types of music, the things when you fall in love with something, it's not over complex. Just the way that it makes you feel, the way that it makes you feel less anxious, less stress, you know, you, you just get into it. I guess it's a feeling. Well, I don't know. Well, that's the idea, man. If, if, if art. In my opinion, if art doesn't help you to feel more relieved, then it isn't doing its job. Now, there are going to be certain artists that are going to disagree with that, and they're going to feel that they want to create a sense of agitation or they want to create some other effect in the, in the receiver of the art form. That's fine. But from my point of view as a jazz musician, <clears throat> I believe that the experience of the music should be a an uplifting happy positive uh relaxing relieving uh process that to me is the uh objective at least from my perspective of what we intend as members of the verb jazz ensemble yeah i think that's also something really so powerful because like we we've, we've been talking for the past hour and you're very passionate about the art form and passionate about jazz. And it shows a really great strength, especially when you're an instrumentalist and you have a career in music where this is something that you've worked towards, you know, something that you've built towards. And more than that is you got to be an artist. You know, I feel like 
that is the number one thing, especially for younger artists today, is like that opportunity. I I thank you for your kind words, and that's a nice compliment. I appreciate that. And uh, you know, the path was simply one of following what I enjoyed listening to. Uh, I was inspired by other great musicians. I endeavored to try to understand what they accomplished to some degree. I put in enough time to practice enough to be able to attempt to emulate uh, some of the music that they played. I uh, attempted to uh, share the insights with other listeners, uh, and I did it because I loved it. Uh, and that's the key to all of this. I did it because I loved it. I continue to love it. I, I want to share it because I feel that it brings meaning and hopefully some good vibes to other people's lives. And as a musician, that's what I bring to the game. Uh, so uh, if, if that is what turns it, uh, <laughs> an interest into a career, I so be it. But that's, that's it. I mean, I, I don't actively teach. A lot of my colleagues do. Uh, I, I don't have time for that. Uh, but I share what I uh, do enjoy in the art form verbally. I do podcasts. I do a lot of interviews. You know, th this is, I guess, my my shtick. I, I this is the educational part of of what I do. I, I talk. Well, it's a good way of doing it, and it's a great way of broadening approach and awareness to jazz and. Maybe possibly getting some people that weren't interested in jazz, giving them a second thought. You know, let me let me try this out. Let, let's see how this goes. Uh, question for you, for all these wonderful people, where can they find your work, the stuff that you're doing? I know you have a website. We have all of those things. Well, if you'd like to follow the Verb Jazz Ensemble, Go to uh, followvje.com and join our email list, and we will keep you posted on our performances and recording projects and other cool things. Uh, verve-jazz.com is our website, and we have all of our recordings and, of course, our performance calendar and videos and uh, reviews and all kinds of stuff on the band and bios and uh, interesting, interesting stuff that people can learn about the musicians and the music and the projects and all of our work. Uh, and of course, you can follow us on um, uh, all of the major uh, social media platforms and listen to us on Spotify and Apple Music and uh, everywhere that you can find music anywhere perfect that's great you got one great place to get everything and to check out all the different kind of sides of jazz and learn something you know I, I did see on the website where there are articles there's biography there um so you get to read and learn some things about um instrumentalists and artists you didn't know before um and uh, if you want to find out the podcast uh, you could find us on facebook tiktok instagram and youtube at lost the groove pod uh, so with that thank you so much for coming on and sharing your work and your experience and career josh it's been a real been an absolute real pleasure all right guys we'll see you on the next one bye everybody ha. Ta -da. <laughs>